Hello everybody and welcome along to this week's edition of the uh, Rebel Boy Ball. Um, I suppose we've got to start with good news and again the vaccine has dominated a lot of the good news stories uh, at the start of the week in particular when um, uh, Margaret Keenan, the lady of Fermanagh, became the first person on the planet to get the vaccine. Got me thinking a little bit like as you know we have I, I, I think a thing in rural Ireland in particular maybe elsewhere as well about who was the first in a parish to do anything, you know, who was the first in Glengariff to buy a donkey, or who was the first in Ballyhooley to have a tractor, or maybe in a headache could be the first person that bought a soil shaft, or, well, hopefully, um, in the not so distant future, we'll be talking about the first person in every parish in the country that uh, got the vaccine. No, okay, I have to admit that maybe everybody is not going to go down the road, some people are not totally enamoured about, about it, but for the majority of people, I'd imagine, that this is a, a godsend in these very difficult and uh, uh, trying times. Also, uh, during the week, the um, student nurses found themselves, well, they didn't find themselves, but their uh, lack of uh, payment, I suppose, for work done during certain parts of COVID dominated the headlines. And uh, it wasn't, again, the greatest of weeks for the government parties, but ideal for the opposition when they brought this uh, to the floor of the doll and um, you know the government parties all had to tow the party line and they voted against uh, paying the nurses, uh, the student nurses I should say. Now this is probably a little bit more complicated than the opposition would like us to think about it but I think one uh, good aspect of it was that I have no doubt that there will be a better pay scale if you could use that for student nurses going, uh, going forward. Uh, Brexit well, it's going to dominate our lives for quite a while by all accounts. And, um, you know, what I can understand about it in terms of the the information we have, we are told that there are 90%, 97% of the waiters uh, brokering a deal. Uh, for those of you who, during school exams, hovered up at that level of uh, performance, sadly for a lot of us, I don't think we were ever in that league, uh, if you got 97%, you were nearly there. But on this occasion, the last 3% must be worth a lot more than the 3% that we normally associate with. Um, there's massive gaps, seemingly. But I presume eventually something will be worked out. But um, uh, during the week, then you had the the famous meal in Brussels between Boris and Ursula. Uh, and uh, again, I'm not sure about the the whole purpose of it. Do they actually think they're going to sit down and chew and uh, discuss such important topics as sorting out these uh, situations? Uh, I think it was more of a publicity stunt than anything else. Uh, good thought that the Northern Ireland Protocol was sorted out and, um, you know, particularly for, I suppose, people in the border areas and all over the place, it's good that that at least has been sorted. Well, as we move on to the field of sport, of what a weekend we have coming in. Did we ever think, of course, we don't that we'd be talking about an All-Ireland hurling final as the sleigh was being serviced in Lapland. And uh, what a unique pairing we're going to have on Sunday between Limerick and uh, Watford. This is the first time that this pair have met in amongst the Championship. Of course, you do know that they met already, I mean, in All-Ireland final, I should say. You do know that they met already in the Munster Championship. And, you know, for long periods, Limerick were the dominant side and uh, then Watford came back into it. We've had a bit of this about this Limerick side, but... And uh, this is their chance, in one sense, of creating incredible history. Um, it's no kind of recognised that you got to win to all Ireland's uh, to be, uh, I suppose, that special person. If you look at the Clare Hurlers, how many of them have made a real good living out of winning their to all Ireland's. Uh, so, you know, Limerick stand on the brink of history, if you like. And you might think that's a little bit unusual, but isn't it, isn't it I suppose, crazy in one sense that the majority of the the country and some the neutrals in this uh in this match if you like will be shouting against the team that have only won two all islands in 80 years and that's limerick's tally uh for watford what an incredible year it has been for them you know they were not fancied by anybody you well aware of that fact and how they came through uh, i suppose the victory over cork was what set them on the road um uh, one thing we've noticed about them, of course, like is that they seem to be playing with a, a a lot, a greater sense of maturity about them than maybe Watford teams in the past that may have had more talented hurlers. 
but on the big day, and I'm talking about the All-Ireland Day because, you know, Watford teams in the past have done very well in, um, in, in Munster games, but when it came to it, like it's 61 years since they won that title back in 1959, and I mean, wouldn't it be great for them? And uh, somebody said you want to have a real hard heart not to want them to win on Sunday. Um, how it's going to go, I'm not too sure. Obviously, the bookies and uh, the experts are pointing towards uh, Limerick. I mean, there's a huge degree of physicality about them, and they talk about their half back line and half forward line. And, you know, that the, the half pack line in particular, if you look at that, Kyle Hay is a huge man on one side, and then on the other side, you have uh, got Dermot Burns, who is not alone a great defender, but an attacker as well. And uh, Declan Hannon, the team captain in the middle, and their influence will have to be curtailed. And we have the job of curtailing them are probably the unknown players on this Watford team. You have Jack Prendergast, Jack Fagan, the mead man, and Jake Dillon. So that particular set of battles, and of course the puck out strategy from the respective goalies uh, is going to be, you know, Stephen O'Keefe will be doing the pokey out for, for Watford and he'll probably have, you know, I think he's going to have a big say in this match. Uh, Nicky Quaid is an outstanding goalkeeper, were it not for that save that he made against um, uh, Harnady, um, Seamus Harnady a couple of years ago. Um, I deny Cork a real, real possibility. But anyway, it's all about these two on one this occasion. Then you talk about the um, the Limerick half forward line, which has been, you know, that that again the two big men, Tom Morrissey and and Groot Hager in particular, the way they are huge target men and Keane Lynch in the middle. And whether he starts there, it's in the field. He'll be going forward, taking short, you know, picking up short puck holes and laying it off, and. The Watford half back line, now oh, these can all change, of course. But you know, if Callum Hayes and Tyg the Borka, and of course, Kevin the long seven, Kevin Morn, uh, you know, again, like I seem to be thinking that it's the Watford going to have to start limit, stop Limit from their playing, playing their game. But, um, there are a few maybe pointers that would indicate that Watford have a you know, have a real good chance here as well. Limerick seemingly have been doing a lot more fouling this year in the than in the past, and and this occasion, the uh, free taking will be will be absolutely vital, and um, you know Limerick's free taking is always you know a top class in that Aaron Galan rarely misses. But then Stephen Bennett, who's taken over the role from Podrick Man, he he has to be really sharp, and he's been doing you know so far so good for him, if you like. Um, so there are so many subplots within this game. One thing I'm a little I won't say surprised. Uh, uh, I know a lot of us were caught up last week about the famous uh, Galway Cork Ladies football game. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But I remember um, the Galway manager, I can't think of his first name, uh, second name was Rabbit, but anyway, he made a, a comment about the ladies football that um, they appointed uh, a carry referee for one of the Cork games. He was, um, he, he, he thought that was a little bit of a problem. Um, did you think for one moment that that a carry referee was going to be favouring Cork in anything? But this weekend, the the the, the referee for the for the game is from Tipperary for the Horgan, and he actually played on a, a Tipperary County team, uh, and on the same team you had Liam Cal, the current Watford manager. And it was you know like these little scenarios. Is there another referee around the place? But anyway, uh, generally speaking these riffs but all these things behind it but it's, it's the perception and um you know like you you had a, a situation where there's a, an, an irish referee andrew brace who was down to riff uh one of the um the big rugby games in 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 uh in this weekend in the champions cup the heineken champions cup between toulouse and exeter and be, and he refed the match last week between england and france and because he got so much grief in social media that the um, European Rugby Commission pulled him from that match. No, it's not that he's been taken off a panel. He's refereeing another match next Friday. Instead, they just swapped the referees around. But I only hope on Sunday that there's going to be no pressure on uh, Fergal, uh, Fergal Hogan in terms of this match. Um, but going back to Limerick for a second, this could come down to an influence of a woman. 
uh, Caroline Collard, who is the uh, Sligo Barn sports psychologist, who has an incredible record of being involved with teams that win All-Ireland. You know, she was involved with Tyrone when they won their All-Ireland, their last one in 08, the Tipperary Hurling team in 2010, the Dublin football team in 2011. And uh, of course, in 2018, she was with Glimmerick, not with them last year. And I think she would have prevented that loss to Kilkenny in the semi-final. Um, but like she's back on board and there is, there is, you know, these sports psychologists. I know some people have different views on it, but uh, this lady seems to have worked the oracle with teams and, uh, you know, her, her modus operandi seems to benefit the players greatly. So she may have a, a role in that. Back to finally from a Watford, there's no doubt that Austin Gleeson and Daisy Hutchinson, they're two, I suppose, main forwards, besides Stephen Binner, are going to have really massive games. It's going to be strange, isn't it, that, you know, the two managers during the week, had, you know, had to issue statements telling people, you know, to stay safe, maybe watch the match in their own homes, uh, rather than congregating in uh, large crowds or anything like that. Uh, probably no cup presentation, but whoever wins it, won't it be some absolutely massive achievement. If Limerick win it, will be the first time they're doing their two in a row. Uh, not time, first time in a row, no, but this, this team will have two. Um, they'll have their two All-Ireland medals, but Watford, um, you know, the, I suppose, outside of Limerick, the entire country will be will be uh, shouting for them. So it is going to be, yeah, an incredible occasion. And of course, we can't forget the big game before it is uh, the Joe McDonough Cup final between Kerry and Kerry and Antrim. And of course, Antrim are the favourites here, no doubt, no more about that. But for Kerry, those small, nine little parishes up in North Kerry, I know there's a couple of guys in Kilgavin and Kinmare maybe on the panel, but it's about that hurling, uh, tiny enclave. Um, and they all play at the same level of hurling. It's an incredible championship down there. And we need is a serious, serious badge of honour. But can Kerry uh, come up, uh, get over the line in this occasion? Obviously, for those that have connections with the county, and I would imagine anybody that follows hurling in Munster will be rooting for them. They are, I won't say the ironic thing, but the most uni unique thing. You can see the difficulty they have of getting um, Britain out of Europe in Brexit. Will the hurling fraternity have no problem in getting teams from other provinces into, into Leinster? Because already, as you know, Galway playing the list of hurling championship. If whoever wins the Joe McDonough Cup on Sunday in Croke Park uh, will play in the Leinster Championship next year. And like, that has to be uh, a most un a most unusual scenario, if you like. Um, after all the debate last week about um, lady sport, um, I suppose this, the, the controversy about fixtures and about the venue change and all of that, um, do you know what? I think a, a, a silver lining big time applies here. And this will focus the governing bodies of these organisations to do something about it in terms of having one organisation for the development of both sports. Now, you might point and say that there is not huge evidence that it works maybe in rugby and soccer uh, for the ladies. But I do think that uh, for Gaelic games in particular, like that, you know, a lot of these uh, clubs are the same clubs that play hurling and football. Uh, sisters and brothers uh, playing and different conditions of playing. No, I don't think that the um, the organisations themselves, they got so much stick last week, are going to do this without a bit of an outside problem. And it may take um, a ministerial intervention. Say what you like about Shane Ross, but um, when you told the FBI boys that the postman wouldn't be calling with the chick to bail them out, they weren't long getting their act together and there was fellas in, packing to the hills that had been uh, in that organisation for a long time and maybe something like that. But I would have thought that the actions of five girls, court girls, jewel players, uh, you know, the, that's when that all started. Uh, that should end up on a Monday night with the Taoiseach of the country uh, and making comments and intervening. Well, maybe not intervening, that might be too strong a word. So I think good will come from it. Uh, but I do think that it may take an outside push to ensure that I'm not saying this won't happen again, my God, it will, of course, but at least that uh, having like the, the, the ladies football in the Camoga, there's no doubt they should be together. And a lot of clubs around the country that have these sports, they have this one club model, um, you know, everything under the one roof, which is to be greatly welcomed. But anyway, um, 
Whereas last weekend, it was, it was a bit of negativity. This weekend, the, the Saturday could be uh, described as being a super Saturday from, from a lady's sport point of view in this country. We have the Camogie final at uh, 7 o'clock on Saturday evening between uh, Galway and Kilkenny. Uh, Galway, the All-Ireland champions, and they beat to win, I think it's their fourth title. It'll be the first time in their history if they did back-to-back. Kilkenny are going for their is it 14th. They've already won 13. They won back in 2016, but they have lost three in a row. And at the start of the season, there was a lot of talk about, you know, that the Kilkenny team, a lot of their girls had uh, decided to take the year out or maybe pack it in altogether. But they're back in business and, um, you know, their win over Cork, which was not expected. Uh, Cork seriously disappointed in losing that game in Parky Cave. But look, uh, the Kilkenny team, their, you know, players watch out for Denise Gall, who uh, after a slow start against Cork settled brilliantly and uh, landed some great scores. And then you had uh, Miriam Walsh and Anne Dalton getting the goals. Uh, Galway, well, their team captain, Sarah Devran, she will never forget this year for many, many reasons. If they win on Sunday, she becomes the first captain in 54 years uh, to do back-to-back Mogi titles. And of course, she will also remember this year, I presume, for the fact that she made two attempts to get married back in March and on the 4th of December. Uh, but if we're to win, I'm sure that she'd forget about all of that. Watch out as well for a girl called Rebecca Hindley. She's the uh, lady that does the sideline cuts. And uh, there's two points for those now, as you know. So, And, and also, it must be said that Komogi has got a lot more attractive to, to watch uh, since they made some rule changes, allowed a bit more of physicality and uh, a couple of more little minor uh, uh, changes along the way. So, yeah, I'm looking really, really looking forward to that. And then you have the FAI uh, Women's Cup final. That's in the Tallis Stadium at a quarter past three on Saturday. And, of course, here we have Cork City versus uh, Piemont United. And uh, Piemont are the, um, I suppose, the team in forum. They're the league champions. They're going for the double. They have uh, beaten Cork, I think, on maybe twice this season already. And, um, you know, they will be the favourites. Uh, Cork's last victory, I think, was back in 2017 when they beat UCD. A girl called Claire Shine from Douglas, who's now playing with Glasgow Celtic, scored a goal that day. Um, for this Cork uh, City team, the captain, like, they're a young side. And Marie O'Sullivan is the team captain. And, of course, Sir Noonan, the Nemo Rangers Gaelic footballer, Cork City soccer player. And, of course, the Cork Gaelic footballer who will be in action, please God, uh, in Croke Park on uh, Sunday week in the All Ireland Ladies Football Final. Yeah, but you know, Saturday is going to be the day for a big day, as I said, in uh, in in ladies sport. And uh, you know, we send best wishes, obviously, to Cork City in their efforts uh, to win that particular cup. Um, in terms of of, of other GA matches, it's, it's a big weekend for for uh, for two Cork hurling teams. The under eighteen, sorry, the minor team, which is under seventeen. Um, they play Limerick in a semi-final in Thurles at one o'clock. Uh, and then at half past four, yes, at half past four, it's, it's a Cork versus Limerick in the Munster on the 20 semi-final. And that game goes on in the uh, Gaelic grounds. The Cork under, the, they're called the Cork minor team now, you know, under 17. That age, that age changed, I think, for the start of the 2018 championship. Um, there was an under 17 championship played that year as well. And interestingly enough, Cork won that one. And they got to the All Ireland minor final under 18 at the same time. And a number of those players now will be talking them later on or in the under 20. But this is a new team, and a lot of, um, you know, they had one big win over Clare. Don Logue Cusick is the manager. He's, it's an interesting scenario with Don Logue. Uh, he's, the job only for one year is passing on to Noel Furlong for the 2021 season. But, you know, we've heard so much about Cork not in win, you know, not having won All Ireland for a while. It's, I think, since 1999, since they won a number 21, 2001, a minor, and, you know, 2005, a senior. So the county definitely needs to win, uh, or at least perform really well. And they've been doing okay now in the past number of years. My God, it's not it's far from doom and gloom. But, um, you know, like, we'll be getting to know these players. Bing Cunningham now is a big player for them, as has been O'Connor there from the Bears and then you from Bell and Colleague, James Dwyer, it's a great name, up in that neck of the woods, and Owen Downey, uh, who's Robert Downey's brother, is the uh, team captain. And um, the subs that came on the, in, in their game against Clare, there was uh, Jack Leahy, William Buckley scored six points between them. Uh, so, yeah, that's... And if they win, they'll be playing the Munster final 
against either Tipperary or in Waterford, and that game goes on on the uh, 20th of December. And, um, you know, it's great that they got that opportunity to get back, I suppose, playing minor hurling. They thought maybe that the year would, it wouldn't happen, but it has, thankfully. For the under-20, and this is really, really important match, they defeated Kerry uh, 224 to 210, and even though Kerry, in fairness to them, did play well, it was never going to be a real serious match. And this core team, as I said, now have won, you know, they have... Some of them were playing in that under-17 team that won the All-Ireland. Some of them then were beaten in an All-Ireland final. And players like, you know, Dara Connery, who Connery, who, who comes from the PRC club. Uh, the, you have three players then from from um, from Blarney in uh, Party Porsche and Barrett. And um, Declan uh, Hennen, uh, Hanlon, I should say. Keep calling him Declan. I keep calling him Hanlon. Uh, they are three very important players. Ono Callaghan. Um, Conor Callan, I should say, the cornerback from Drum Tariff. Uh, these are well seasoned players at this stage now. You have the Roach brothers from uh, uh, Bright Rovers, then Timmy O'Connell from Middleton. Alan Connolly gets his chance now. A lot of talk about him, you know, he's the Black Rock player. And you have Anne Walsh Barry from Carrick Tool, Sean O'Donoghue from Corsi Rovers. So I really do fancy them. Pat Ryan is their team manager. And um, if they get to an All-Ireland, uh, I think that's uh, played in the 22nd, maybe, of, 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 the, of uh, if they get to a Munster final, I should say. I fancy them to do that. Um, I suppose the week that passed was also noteworthy that I often wonder when players announce their retirement, do they get the phone call before or after? But anyway, during the week, there were uh, a big retirements on the game, and I suppose the big one was was Anthony Nash and uh, uh, Aidan Walsh. Uh, Anthony, of course, who has served in, in goal since uh, Don Locke's except their own, and he had a fairly... You know, I know he didn't win the major prize in terms of uh, an All-Ireland, but um, he's been a good goalkeeper and a good servant. Aidan Walsh, likewise, of course, he has his All-Ireland medal from, from football. And then you heard Conor Lee Han. You know, I suppose he'd be a little bit disappointed to be dropped from the panel. Christopher Joyce, that doesn't mean that they, they won't get back in. Uh, from a Pierce again, then Chris O'Leary from Valley Rovers. Uh, I often find and see that when players leave the county set up, there's, there, there are big benefits to their uh, uh, local clubs. Uh, so we'll watch how they get on. And finally, then during the week, next Tuesday night, Kerry play Cork in the Munster Minor Football semi final. And my God, this is another big game, like because Cork. Um, you know, they won last year's minor in under-20 All-Ireland, but they they didn't win the under-20 this year in Munster. Kerry won that. And um, I think this is an important game as well. And and, and that final, uh, the Munster final, I think, goes on in the 22nd. So all of these finals, uh, it's great that they'll be finished, <laughs> albeit that they'll be played Christmas week. And there was a time where somebody said that... Um, players are expected to play on Christmas week. They'd be absolute... Uh, an old cry, what were the GA thinking? But um, things have changed and uh, that's when they're on. In um, terms of um, soccer, for those of you who uh, are followers of Manchester United, the LA story keeps going on and during the week. What a disaster in Europe losing out in the uh, Champions League. But he gets a chance then again every single match they lose in Europe. Is, uh, or any big match seen... I don't. I, I, this is a Jekyll and Hyde carry on. Uh, they play Manchester City this weekend, and of course that's a big derby game. Sports who were the surprising leaders at the top of the league, and we have a few sports fans around the place. They play, play Crystal Palace, Arsenal who are going through a really tough time, and uh, they play Burnley. Chelsea who are up there at top play Everton and uh, Liverpool, where that uh, Cork goalie is absolutely flying since Kevin Keller since he got his chance. They take on Fulham, and um, I think everything is going well uh, for Keevean. And even though that a lot of people aren't Liverpool supporters, and the nice that there's a Cockman uh, doing well in that one. And finally, we have the um, the Champions Cup, the Heineken Champions Cup in rugby, and all of the Irish provinces are playing this weekend. And basically, where this is going to operate uh, from this weekend up to the um, end of January, they will play. Each team will play three matches and after that then there's a quarter final set up and uh, this weekend Leinster will be, I suppose, looking at it from uh, Leinster will be 
hoping that they will win this particular um, championship. They are always, at, you know, being spoken about as potential winners. For Munster and Ulster, very much kind of an even, Stephen, even though that they've been brilliant in the Pro 14, winning all their uh, matches. I'd say if they are there around the knockout stages, they'd be relatively happy. Uh, Connacht, if they survive, you know, they haven't they come a long way? Do you remember when they are, if you were trying to, to, to get rid of them completely? And they have a good club up there now. So they're all in action. Connacht, uh, mentioning them, they go to Racing. And of course, Simon Zebo's over there, and that's going to be a, a massive test for them. Uh, also, play Toulouse tonight, that game. Um, again, there's, you know, like I think also would be fancied in those ones. Munster play Harlequins, and I think they do, should do well there. Uh, it looks like they could, three of the Irish provinces could win. Uh, you know, I'm not too sure that, 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 um, that uh, the, the, the boys of Con the Connacht would have a serious chance up against uh, Racing. So until the next time, uh, dear listeners and dear viewers, take care and mind yourself.